welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 707. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December 21st, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. Maybe the last show of the year, depending on our schedules. We don't know. Uh, we get to this point in, in our season, and sometimes we, we get another chance to record, but sometimes after Christmas, George is just too exhausted, and I'm too exhausted, or we're traveling, or chaos has ensued, or something bigger or badder has happened in the world, and George and I just don't have time to record. I can't hold out our schedule uh, <laughs> before you yet, so I don't know. If this is the last one of the season, Happy New Year. But something more important than that, Merry Christmas, because this is the last show before Christmas. And um, George and I were doing our pre-show and looking for stories and looking for stories. And I didn't see any Time Magazine story that said, is Christmas real or is it pagan? Newsweek hasn't put out their yearly article, uh, God is surely dead. Time Magazine does that once in a while. And I'm like, what happened to the war on Christmas? This is kind of boring, so we have nothing to report on, but why don't we talk about kind of the changing culture, which has really decided, or it's being decided for them, that Christmas is not just about Western consumerism. But before that, George, how are you doing this week? I'm exhausted. Uh, <laughs> I've been running a marathon. Uh, I didn't take a vacation this year. Uh I haven't had a time off since 2019 with COVID and just Christmas is the busy time. You run up to it. We had our pageant. Last week we had our pageant. The week before we had the bishop, bishop visit. And I have to tell you, a Christmas pageant is the most stressful church service possible because you have the children and it's trying to herd sheep and goats and ducks uh, down the aisle. And we use... Uh, small dogs as sheep for the nativity scene and the ch dogs are almost always better behaved than the children uh and so we survived that and it's wonderful but i gotta tell you kevin uh here i'm in no time at all i'll be my i'll hit 60 and this is the prime of life professionally and all this and that i have to tell you the amount of joy and satisfaction i have being in the service working with the children, singing in the Christmas carols, being, knowing everybody in that room, knowing their joys, their sorrows, their triumphs, their tragedies. I understand completely uh, the, you know, the Christian concept of love your neighbor and your as yourself and family. Uh, there is no better life than being a parish priest. I have, I've said that before, but it's uh, uh, events like this past weekend that bring it home. Yeah, well, I want to and, emphasize there's no better life than being called to be a parish priest. <laughs> I just, well, I'll be a parish priest. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold, hold on. <laughs> Too many people have just said that. No, it's, you know, it's, it, it should not be something on the career card unless you feel called to do it. So, no, I absolutely well, agreed. Well, we had, I guess I've done it long enough now, or maybe I'm mature enough in my faith and spiritual life that, there, me, I love everybody there. There's people I don't really want to spend any time with, but I still love them. And how do I how do I explain that? It's a sort of a soft focus, uh, ignorance. But oh, we have a cranky guy in the choir, and the choir in our church is in the back against the back wall. And I uh, skipped over uh, a bidding prayer at our lessons that serve carols and whatnot, and. This, this cranky old guy is one of these people who loves to shout corrections, you know, no, not at him, this him, it's not his place, all this and that. Now, in the past, that sort of stuff really irritated me. And, you know, he's the sort of guy who shouts, speak up, when he can't hear the person who's reading from the uh, pulpit. But I guess I'm at a point in my life as well, that's who he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And God bless him for being a cranky old man. It adds spice and excitement to the Christmas service. Um, 
I don't know how to explain that, but rather when I really do have this sense of understanding God's love in spite of all the brokenness and failings and what and are falling short of his glory. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what a church is success. I've been reading some theology. I know that's always a bad idea for a priest after the age of 25, you know, because it only gets, only screws things up. But at this stage of my life, I'm really called to uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote this book called Life Together, oh, absolutely. About, uh, yeah. about his time teaching in an underground seminary in the Nazi era, mm -hmm. and how in the, that Christ in community was most fully evident in his life when he was in community. And I get it. I really do get it. It's not like I live in Nazi Germany or anything. I live in the beautiful state of Florida. Uh, it's not New York or California, for goodness sakes. But, you know, we're just so fortunate here with yeah. the uh, the community I, we have and the spirit that there is. I, I have fond memories, and this is probably seven years ago, but at the church we went to back in Watertown, Connecticut, one of the, the members was a high-functioning uh, savant, for lack of a better term, a Rain Man type character. And for some reason, we er, early on in our friendship, we just never bonded. There's something about him that has irked me. And I'm just like, I maybe you've seen Rain Man, obviously, you know, some people are irked by that type of character. And I'm like, I, I, I would pray and say, Father, you know, clearly it's me. And we need to work on Kevin so that, uh, you know, my, my friend, I'm not going to name him now, but uh, uh, that there would be a place in my life for him and, and vice versa. And just over time, God re just slowly revealed a, a way to have a conversation with this person. And the last two years before we went, moved out of that church to, to go to Milford, you know, this person and I became very good friends and we learned how to communicate and learned how to enjoy each other. And, it, you know, that was the, that love thy neighbor moment for me, that if I can love this person and this person can love me, I can love anybody because it was just one of those, I, I can invest in being irked by him or I can invest in trying to find a way forward with him. And mm -hmm. I, I knew when I found my way forward, uh wow now about my brother no <laughs> so uh it, it's one of those things and uh th that that was that's kind of the joy of the fellowship of, of coming together and encouraging one another is dealing with the people who for lack of a better word irk you or just rub you with like sandpaper and that's what he was doing and god overcame that Years ago, I was invited to one of these conferences for new clergy, and uh, I wasn't new. I was maybe 10, 15 years into it at that point. And I'm listening to all these people and just how are these clergy and how they hated their parish and they hated their life and they hated their work because they had this image and this vision of what they were going to be and what they were going to do, and it didn't correspond to the reality. And so the response was almost like, well, I'm going to punish this church for not living up to my expectations. And I felt so sorry and sad for these people because obviously they were not in the right profession. Um, they were not called to the ministry. Uh, they may be intelligent. They may, you know, put up a good front, but they just weren't called. And I don't want to say these are all liberals or all conservatives or no, all evangelicals. No. Or yeah. it's they, each individual, you know, was different in this aspect. But I think I understand why the church is collapsing. If some, if if frankly, if the majority of the people at that conference were miserable, if your if your priest is miserable, you going to have a miserable church. I hate to say that like that. I mean, but who wants to go to a place where you got? constantly nagged and harumphed or have somebody tell you how smart they are and how dumb you are and why you should think this way. That's not the spirit of Christ. And one of the things I've seen, in, especially in the last 10 years, is the, the church trying to uh, deal with the politics of the day, because the politics of the day are so divisive. 
you know, whether it's an Anglican church, an Episcopal church, uh, Roman Catholic church, uh, in your pews are people who have political opinions. And sometimes they associate those political opinions with uh, their spiritual life or their re religiousity. I can't even say words today, sorry. And how do you navigate that? And I see priests who become, become very divisive because they don't know how to navigate and serve and encourage the whole body. They know how to encourage the body that they support and the, the, the political realm that they support. And that's kind of a, a new difficulty we find in this, this Gen Z age, George. Well, it's not just Gen, Gen Z. It's, uh, <clears throat> uh, I've raised up the deacons that now serve at my parish. Um, they were lay people when I came here. They've now been ordained. And I had some deacons, one lovely woman who finally passed away at 92. I was really mad because after getting her trained after three years, she left at 89 to get married. Now, you raise up a young woman. That's so And then they run man. off and get married. <laughs> and then they get married at 89 and move to Simi. I mean, come on now. You know, that. But. There's, you know, I had two deacons who were in their late 50s, early 60s, who just liked to be kings. And they didn't, weren't really interested in spiritual things. They were interested in running the show, sort of running the, the, the Sunday service, you know, stand up, sit down, do this, mm -hmm. do that, don't do this, don't do that. And, <clears throat> and the charism of ministry, and they're very have very high powerful professional jobs in the in the regular life but that doesn't translate over into a call to serve to service especially as a deacon um so i don't want to make it a generational thing entirely because they're the crappy clergy of all age ages <laughs> and i hate to say this but a, a good a, the majority of clergy I think the church would be better off with fewer with a really bad flu season this year <laughs> and, mm. and uh, cleaning out the, the, the dead wood. Yeah. So let's move on to the only topic we could think of, and that's kind of how um, there's less of a war on Christmas this year, uh, at least in the press. Yes, you get your is Christmas pagan story that you have to put that out there. You got it. You know, Christian periodicals and, and secular periodicals will always put their uh, pagan uh, Easter and pagan Christmas story. Got it. You, that's been covered. But as far as the the putting out the hopelessness in faith stories, and faith is only served by science, and faith is only served by you know uh, Western intelligentsia. That's kind of different. You know, I, I'm I'm seeing. You know, the failure of the Hallmark Christmas generation and more of the, the this is a great time to learn about the real Christmas story and to break through with the real story and uh, controversy of the Advent and the real story in uh, the resurrection. Maybe, you know, we have this opportunity now as Christians when the society and secular society so disappointed with their idea of Christmas to reintroduce them to the real idea and the real event of Christmas, George. I think you're spot on, Kevin, but I would I would broaden that topic a bit. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I agree with you that the whole, uh, you know, the, the grocery you know, uh, friend of mine uh, uh, in England wrote me with outrage that uh, one of the grocery store chains is putting out, I think it was Marks and Spencer's or Mary Pigmas, you know, uh, a little uh, piggy ornament. Um, how disrespectful is that? But the thing is, that stuff doesn't shock anymore. And, you know, the commercialization. Festivus. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, that just, it's like goes over my head. Uh, local, uh, car dealership with the, the little local ads with the people dressed up as elves and and this and that you know that it means nothing it really means nothing so that the commercialization and uh, and, and the popular music on the now i have to say that if i do hear if they know it's christmas one more time i will die 
or if I <laughs> hear George Michael, you know. <laughs> if George Michael sings "Last Christmas," I gave you my heart one more time on the car radio. That car radio is being sent oh, to the dump. Okay, so except for those two irritants, commercialization I don't think really affects anybody now because we're so inured to it. Mm -hmm. What I think is remarkable is that the typical liberal outrage. You know, as you cited this sort of Newsweek and Time magazines, did Jesus really exist? Or the Canadian bishops, we mentioned Anna Greenwood Lee, who is the wokester of the moment, the Bishop of British Columbia, who's such a dump, uh, dunce, excuse me, such a dumb woman. I'm sure she's bright in some ways, but she enjoys being provocative and, you know, saying like, if only we had grown up without white jesus pictures because jesus wasn't white perhaps we'd be better christians and we defeat the racism now there might be a germ or something in that but you know the, her point isn't finding the true jesus her point is look you know modern racial justice nonsense that stuff is passe you know i i i can't you know if jack spong appeared on the scene today and denied the virgin birth, which he has, and denied the resurrection, which he did, and all that. that. Nobody would care. He wouldn't sell a single book. It's passe. But what does catch the imagination, a friend of mine sent me an article from Politico, uh, not Politico, but politics.co.uk, mm -hmm. the British sort of version of Politico, by an MP named Tim Farron. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, Farron had been the head of the Liberal Democratic Party, which is sort of a center-left party. But he's also a committed evangelical Christian and is personally opposed to abortion and gay marriage. And even though he supported the party line on these issues, he was basically thrown out of leadership because he didn't have pure thoughts. And he's still in Parliament as an MP. And now he's writing like there, this article in Politics Today is more Christian than anything I've seen from any bishop of the Church of England about uh, he attacks the com consumerism and commercialism, but he also attacks the message. Uh, he also says the message of Jesus Christ is an affront to liberals and conservatives. Now, Tim Farron gets it. Mm -hmm. And here's somebody who on the political spectrum, I don't really agree with many of his policies. But in what he wrote, I see this as a brother in Christ. And this comes back, Kevin, to your talk about politics within the church. We're at a point where we have uh, no uh, no uh, leaders anymore who are in the church that I can see. Oh, there's oh. one calling now. <laughs> no, it's. I'm sure it's. Uh, something about my car warranty having expired. It, it's the, the a lawyer from the next libel lawsuit we get. Um, and, you know, that's the interesting part here in my conversation now. Florida is so different than Connecticut. In Connecticut, this is happy holidays. When shopping, when going out, when going to the grocery store, if somebody said happy holidays to me, I would say, and Merry Christmas to you. If this brought up the conversation that I'm offended by Merry Christmas, I would say you should be absolutely offended that uh, God assumed the world needed a savior. Uh, that, that should offend you. Let's talk. It's a great opportunity. And that is what Christmas should be, not about presents, but about the opportunity uh, God affords us in, in the birth of a savior here. Um, Actually, Kevin, you and Tim Farron are on the same page where Farron says the opportunity for Christmas to be offensive is an opportunity for us to tell the non-Christian world what it's all about, why it matters, what it means. Uh, Kevin, you're more on point than just about any bishop. Well, there was a good one from the Windard Islands, <laughs> but just about any there. bishop. Yeah. There's a couple, yeah, yeah, but the vast majority are basically sorts of things that the UN could release, you know, uh, on uh, World Feel Good Day. Um. Well, now, in fairness, I was raised in, in the 70s and 80s 
uh, where mom and dad would turn on the latest Johnny Cash Christmas musical. And you, that, was, that was Christmas. Or Lauren Swalk. You get, no offense to any of those people, but I learned early on that uh, when, when I became a Christian, the Christian was so much more than what was being uh, told to me uh, by uh, the uh, give and get gifts society. Um, so it is what it is. But in that realm, how do we explain to, with this opportunity given to us, what Christmas really means? You know, the, the, the church has this opportunity where the West has finally exhausted itself with getting things. What do we have to offer, George? We have to offer ourselves mm -hmm. because, you know, as the old saw goes, the best, the best version is the Bible is the way you live your life. Um, Friends, viewers, tell me who this was, but I think it was Tertullian or somebody who says, who said in the early second or third century, you will know Christians by their love, um, how they, they how they love each other, how they treat each other. Mm -hmm. There's a move, uh, I'm going to unfairly characterize this, but Rod Dreher has this move, the Benedict Option, where Christians just sort of retreat to their fortresses and wait until good times come. It's very persuasive, very uh, enticing to want to sort of move to. When I read the book, I was ready to do that. <laughs> like, he, and in but, fact, it can be argued I've done that. But go <laughs> make your point. But my point is that I actually think the opposite: that yeah. we should go out into the world and engage with these people, talk to them, show them our love, show them our concern, treat them as we would a Christian brother or sister. And some of them are going to ask, well, what's about, you know, what is it with them? What do they have that I would like that I find missing in my life? Not everybody understands that they have a God-shaped hole in their heart that needs to be filled. But enough people do. Um, it, it's funny. Perhaps it's Florida. I don't know. But when I go, I went to the grocery store dressed like this uh, yesterday. And I had... At least half a dozen people say thank you for what you do thank you for your service as if i was a veteran just back from afghanistan now i wasn't limping or anything and no. i didn't have blood dripping no but my, my point is that maybe it's in florida we still live in christendom where there's a cultural understanding of the value of christ that doesn't translate into church attendance but still there's a residual understanding of what God is all about. Now, I don't know if that's true in Connecticut anymore. Well, to make the point that uh, until we understand what Christmas is really about um, and what Merry Christmas really means and the seasonal calendar of Advent and Easter, until society recognizes that what that really means again, um, there won't be peace or understanding in Connecticut and even in Florida or other nations. Uh, they've lost that sense of what faith means. They, they don't have faith anymore. And you know, I, I run into people who are nice political bent and, and friendly and all that. And when I get to talking about their faith, it just, they don't have time for it. I, I just don't have time for that, Kevin. And I, I get that we're we're busy in our societies, we're busy in our life, and you know some of us have made a, a decision early on to make faith uh, not a priority but the priority of our lives. Uh, you should make a little time for what you believe in, and but you, you get you get that John Lennon response. Well, I believe in me. Oh no! Jeez, no, 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 jeez! And I'm just going to be the best version of myself. Oh yeah, that's what Stalin said. Cool. <laughs> and so I'm like, it. And that's <sighs> also what Joel. That's what Joel Osteen says. That's what Joel uh, Your best life now. Yeah. Um, he, he he has better teeth and hair than John Lennon, but they're singing this from the same song. Same song. Song. Yeah. But that's for for me. That's the exciting thing about. The ministry of the local church um we have a i have a parishioner who is in the women's prison florida women prison in hernando county to our south 
And our big Christmas project was to buy each of the 600 inmates or convicts, they're convicts in Florida, each of the 600 convicts, uh, an assortment of personal care products uh, that women need. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. um, so I didn't pick those out. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Can opener. But, That's got to work. <laughs> and, and, you know, we had 600 and we gave, uh, and being Florida, uh, we had uh, to get 600 sets of, uh, of uh, white hair care products and 600 sets of black hair care products mm -hmm. because we didn't know what the mix was. And so now everybody can trade if they want to, but uh, all those things. And in talking to the, uh, that's me again with the call, uh, trying to renew my car warranty. I'm sorry. The, w in talking with our parishioner, who's a wonderful Christian girl who only came to Christ after she went to prison. And she's saying, you know, not every prisoner is like this. There are some real hard cases. And they're always going to be. But a lot of these people are in prison being stupid or being thoughtless. Mm -hmm. And some of them who were meth, meth junkies don't even know why, what they did. They can't remember what thing they did that landed them in jail. Mm -hmm. And they reach the point at a certain stage where they ask themselves, what is it all about? What does life mean? What? And here is when my little missionary in the Fernando Women's Institute goes and tells them about Jesus Christ. And then she gets a package of soap and toothpaste and hair care products and sanitary packages from an Episcopal church of all places saying, with a little old saying, God loves you. That touches people, I think, when they're at their lowest point to sort of begin the journey towards out of the holes they've dug for themselves. And you don't have to be a meth addict to be in a hole. You could be a successful banker or businessman oh, yeah. with a beautiful home, beautiful cars, and be in just as bad a place as the crackhead in jail for 10 years for sticking up a liquor store. Well, those are crimes of opportunity. But here in the West, in secular society, we're all about that, you know, stupid opportunities and consumerism and us and me and my and hedonism and uh, all th that brings us further away from a walk with with Christ and it, it's so hard to watch yes there are people behind bars who are in prison but there are people who should be free who are truly imprisoned um, you know and there's some people in Washington who are free who should be behind bars yeah, okay. absolutely you know <laughs> let's never forget yes uh, yeah statistics 28 30 percent of people uh, behind bars in some states are there just on crimes of opportunity you know they, they got caught doing something that they they did not pre-think they were going to do they did it um and it boom there are people in dc and i'm going to go 25 i'm going to give that same stat <laughs> politicians who have you know not been caught yet but have taken opportunities uh uh, and uh, should be incarcerated as well. It's it's a strange world we live in. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like my communist daughter. There's one rule for the rich and one for the poor. No, uh, I said before my parishioner stole about twelve hundred dollars and is serving five years in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are people who gross bodily harm and attempted murder up north who get shorter sentences than that. So don't steal in Florida. It's not a good idea. <laughs> don't, yeah. It, Florida's weird. I mean, this week we uh, upgraded the RV. We sold the old RV Monstro, and uh, uh, one of my neighbors was selling his also older um, uh, Tiffin, and it was an opportunity to, to buy something and get rid of something. Um, I probably did not sell my old RV for as much as I could have gotten for it. I had the opportunity to give it to a family person who was going to use it for his family 
and I'm a sucker for reusing, you know, and not re just, you know, he wasn't going to fix it up and resell it. He was going to live full time in it with his family and probably, you know, in his late early 30s, that was going to be their only home, George. And so I am a sucker for that. Yep. You, you want to pay half, whatever, fine. Just, you know, I know you're going to use it for your family. And um, those are those are great opportunities we have as well that come before us. And, you know, it, it's neat to give in that that fashion here in Florida. There's so many neat people. Uh, one of those things. George, we have talked about nothing for 30 minutes. Should we let the audience go early today? So this is the Seinfeld episode. This is a, uh, a show episode. about nothing. nothing yes. Well, and that's one of the great things is we can sit down and we get comments all the time. I, I'll say, oh, we've got an hour. You guys are the nicest. So no, you could talk all day. No, we can't. I mean, we at some point, we just run out of steam. Uh, George has church to do. Kevin. I have business Kevin. to do. Yes. I have an Indian story. Corruption. No. Yeah. No yeah. pitch. <laughs> and you, well, that one time you did, I was surprised. <laughs> so, but now, hold on. Let's talk a little bit about our families. Uh, my kids, all three, moved to Pittsburgh for uh, career opportunities. Um, they're all doing well. They were raised in Connecticut. I was raised in Wisconsin. You know, that's kind of the, the, that small knowledge base you get to learn about Kevin. Um, your daughters are, you have one right now in India, not seeking corruption, but uh, visiting there, George. And probably profiting from corruption. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have two daughters who were raised and reared in Florida. Uh -huh and they now live in seattle and in the, the san francisco area and one is visiting us uh for the christmas holidays she wanted to come for the sun and poor girl kevin what is it doing outside <laughs> it's, it's raining, raining. <laughs> she wanted to lie by the pool and since we've had rain and clouds for the last few days she's up in gainesville visiting college friends the other uh is on a two-month trip through india and she had a college she had suite mates at uh in her dorm uh, in her dormitory in college mm -hmm. they like live four or five in a little pod or suite mate yeah it's not and, like you, uh, when you and i went to college there was two bunk beds in a room and that was that was dorm life that was it uh but you, i mean but they each had their own bathroom private bathroom girls that doesn't make any sense uh, well two of her roommates were indian from India uh, and she flew to Calcutta and she s flew to Calcutta and s staying with Tanvi for a while the one roommate and Tanvi's family has done very well or maybe because of their case status they're at the top of the pyramid mm -hmm. so when the, she arrived in Calcutta Tanvi said oh my father's taking us to a celebration at the Victoria Memorial private party to mark the 50th anniversary of the India-Pakistan war. And so we're going to take you to the seamstress to have a dress made for you. And okay, and so she goes to this party and Laura was like the jewels and the finery. I mean, in India, you either are as poor as Calcutta is where Mother Teresa was. Right. Was, yes. And now, and then she saw the, the modern Maharajas and now she's at a wedding. She, the other girl is getting married, who's from Chennai, which used to be called Madras. And the family is renting out whole floors of one of the luxury hotels for their for their for, for their guests. And Laura was uh, taken again to a seamstress because an Indian wedding is a two or three day affair that you need several outfits for. And the family has had a seamstress make made to measure clothing. Uh, you know these beautiful saris and gowns for laura uh it's you know like i remember having to pay the rental fee for the tuxedo of my brother the best <laughs> man but buying and buying three or four you know having three or four made to measure dresses for a guest these people have serious money in india i gotta tell you so after chennai she's going to go to pondicherry and then over to goa for christmas and then back to calcutta for for a few more weeks hmm. i hope she's going to get spoiled rotten uh because she's <laughs> she's uh basically seeing how the 
we talk about the one percent in the United States. This is a one millionth of one percent in India. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness! Yeah, you know, it's it's you want your kids to learn. This is a great way to learn. Um, in, in some parts of the world and this nation as well, the wealth some people have is horrifying. And I say this as a capitalist. Okay, you know they they don't bless other people with what they've been blessed with. Okay, um, some very wealthy people give it all away, and I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, my wife and I are in, this, in, in a situation where we are give a, a more than a healthy amount of our resources away, and we think we're called to do that, and we think other people like us are called to do that as well. We raised our kids to do that. They aren't all doing that yet. <laughs> Okay, but uh, it it was interesting. I have three children. I said in Pittsburgh, uh, the first one got her four year degree and got her master's degree and became an engineer, and she's working in the robotics field. The second one says, "Well, I don't want to go to college, but I want to live uh, the middle class lifestyle as the the first child." Well, you're probably going to have to go to college to do that. Oh, well, guess what? <laughs> college college won in that situation. She says, "Okay, I'll go to college." The third one wanted to drop out of college, but he wanted to live that middle class lifestyle of the first child as well. He's still in college. So, <laughs> you know. I, I thought he was in the basement of your RV. You no. Know, uh, well, he is a he, he, all through high school, was what we call a basement dweller. You know, and oh, I'm going to do my homework. And he would just go down there and watch ESPN and other stuff. Uh, in his, his his basement dwelling. Uh, now uh, he's a, an apartment dweller with one of my daughters. They kind of pass him off back and forth while he's going uh, through college. And it's just, you know, I like they're, they're, they're in Pittsburgh, I call Anglican Central. The, you have no excuse but to go to an Anglican church in, in Pittsburgh. So we're one for three so far. Uh, hopefully the other two will, will, will sharpen up. Um, but at that age, uh, I was not a, a regular attender as well. So uh, I, I, have, I have patience here, George. Patience. Although we get to go see them for Christmas. We're flying up there. To well, I, I didn't say to my daughter, go look up the Bishop of Madras, because <laughs> I've written about how he's been indicted for corruption charges. So just you know, keep daddy's business out of, out of your vacation plan. All right. Merry Christmas. We shall see you after Christmas season here is over, but maybe we'll have another show before the 12 days of Christmas is over. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 707 of Anglican Unscripted.